most of you aren't subscribed. Make sure to subscribe, as it helps out the channel. Without further ado, the series starts with our MC, Mama, hearing her father call out to her, asking Mama to deliver some medicine to the Verdigris house, but to be careful of kidnappers. As Mama heads into town, we see a gorgeous woman, Perrin, renowned as one of the three famous princesses of the Verdigris houses, catch the attention of all the men in town. Having dropped off the medicine at the Verdigris house, Mama begins writing up some notes on her most recent experiment, but is interrupted by Perrin, worried that Ma Mao's experiments are harming her. Just then, the granny of the Verdigris house greets Ma Mao, reminding Ma Mao to not perform any risky experiments, wondering if Ma Mao would like to service people and earn a little bit of cash as a courtesan. Not wanting any part of the offer, Ma Mao swiftly leaves, telling granny that she had left her medicine, but right as Ma Mao leaves, the other two princesses appear, sad to not see Ma Mao. As Ma Mao heads home, she passes by herb field, ecstatic to be collecting such luscious herbs, but suddenly is interrupted by some thieves. Kidnapped and taken away, Ma Mao gets worried that her father will be stressed about her disappearance, but at the same time, we see a blue-haired lady, Lady Lahua give birth to a boy and a red-haired lady, Lady Gyokuyu, give birth to a girl, both at the same time. As three months pass by, we follow Ma Mao, now working in the rear of the emperor's palace, where women are raised with the intention of giving birth to the emperor's children. The rear palace forbids any ordinary men, only allowing relatives of the emperor or eunuchs, male workers that have lost limbs and are unable to work normal jobs. The overall location houses 2,000 concubines and servants combined along with 1,000 eunuchs, but Ma Mao knows that since she is a serving girl, her life is expendable. Ma Mao also notes how there are shut-in concubines, but Ma Mao can't really complain about her current job, as she at least gets paid. Running into a fellow service girl, Shaolan, Ma Mao helps guide Shaolan to her delivery location, sad to see that girls are taught the bare minimum to work here, knowing that even servants like her have the opportunity to become low-ranking concubines, but due to her childlike body, Ma Mao brushes the thought aside. That evening, Ma Mao chats with Shaolan, learning that there have been rumors of a very handsome eunuch that had been spotted in the rear palace. That night, we see a very handsome man, Jin Shi, checking up on Lady Lahua and Lady Gyokuyu. Sad to see that Lady Lahua is losing weight and growing ill, but is also terrified that both Lady's children are mysteriously falling ill. The next day, Shaolan reveals to Ma Mao that there have been rumors of a curse plaguing the rear palace, as all three of the emperor's children have mysteriously passed away. Apparently, this curse is also occurring to the blue-haired lady, Lady Lahua and the red-haired lady, Lady Gyokuyu as well. Ma Mao states that since Lady Lahua gave birth to a boy, she would be considered the Empress Consort and the higher ranking of the two women, but there are rumors that the Emperor favors Lady Gyokuyu, meaning a power struggle is inevitable. Whilst eating, Ma Mao also hears Shaolan mention how Lady Lahua is getting sick as well, exhibiting symptoms of headache, stomachache and nausea. Having worked as an apothecary back in her village, Ma Mao begins deducing possible causes that may have led to the symptoms, suspecting that someone must have poisoned Lady Lahua, but rules that thought out after some more thinking. Wondering if the cause is something passed down hereditarily, Ma Mao wonders why she cares so much about rumors, but cheekily remarks that she should at least go and see if the rumors are true. Upon entering a more high-ranking area of the palace, Ma Mao spots a crowd forming around the malnourished Lahua, who is accusing Gyokuyu of cursing her child. Not wanting things to get out of hand, Jin Shi is called to stop the fight, but as Ma Mao gets a closer look at Lahua, she manages to pinpoint the cause of this supposed curse. Passing by Jin Shi as Ma Mao wonders how she can help without exposing herself. Choosing to tie a note onto a mysterious flower, Ma Mao's message is ultimately ignored, leading to Lady Liwa's boy sadly passing away. Cutting to Gyokuyu, she is seen having a private meeting with Jin Shi, revealing that she had received a mysterious message a while ago, telling everyone that the rhododendron flower that the message was tied to, had a white part that was poisonous. Sadly, the palace physicians had ignored the message, but Gyokuyu would like to know who was the genius that gave them the message, asking Jin Shi to track down the genius. Having suspicions of who this person could be, we cut to Shaolan and Ma Mao on their break gossiping about any new updates regarding the emperor, but suddenly one of the eunuchs asks for the girls to head to a part of the palace. 
Upon entering the assigned room, Jin Shi appears, greeting the girls and introducing himself as the manager of the rear palace. Without saying another word, Jin Shi writes a message on a piece of paper, asking only girls with freckles to remain in the room. Afterwards, Jin Shi asks everyone to leave, shocking Ma Ma, as she realizes she was the only one that can read, meaning Jin Shi has found his target. Asking Ma Ma to come quietly, Jin Shi and Ma Ma begin heading through the palace, with Jin Shi revealing that he had looked into Ma Ma, and records said Ma Ma couldn't read, but wanting to not stand out, Ma Ma feigns ignorance. As they enter a different part of the palace, Ma Ma prays that she doesn't get punished for anything, but upon entering Gyokuyu's room, Ma Ma shows relief, seeing Gyokuyu's daughter, Xia Ling, is alive and healthy. Not wanting to take credit for saving Gyokuyu's Xia Ling's life, Ma Ma tries to feign ignorance once again, but Jin Shi pulls out the message received a while ago, stating that he knows the cloth used to write it was most likely from the skirt from a girl working with clothes. With no other reason to hide, Ma Ma reveals that she had figured out that the white powder concubines used to appear paler as poisonous, having seen various women in her village continue to use the white powder, but at the cost of their lives. Ma Ma also adds that she was able to identify the poison, due to being an apothecary, having knowledge in medicine overall. Hearing this, Gyokuyu states that a while ago, she was given the same white powder, but upon discovering that her child along with the nurse that provided the white powder was getting ill. Gyokuyu had stopped using it entirely, ultimately sparing her baby's life. Apparently, Gyokuyu had tried to warn Lahua about the white powder, but Lahua wouldn't listen. Fearing what is to come next, Ma Ma asks what Gyokuyu plans to do with her, but with a cheerful smile, Gyokuyu states that Ma Ma from today will be Gyokuyu's lady-in-waiting, just like an assistant. As Ma Ma walks through the rear palace, Ma Ma wonders if her being discovered is a good or bad thing. But at the same time, we see several soldiers suddenly collapse, suspecting that they've been poisoned. Seeing their men get poisoned, the leader of the soldiers accuse the village leader for assisting the enemies, but just then we cut back to Jin Shi, who has just learned of poisoning to their soldiers. Changing topics for a bit, one of the eunuchs asks Jin Shi about Gyokuyu's new attendant, but Jin Shi states that compared to Liwa's ten attendants, Gyokuyu only has four. But Jin Shi reiterates that Yukuyu is quite smart, only choosing attendants that she can trust, which explains why Ma Ma is a candidate, as her knowledge of medicine is too valuable. Hearing the eunuch fear that Ma Ma may abuse her new positions as Gyokuyu's attendant, Jin Shi reasons that he should seduce Ma Ma a bit. The next morning, Ma Ma is seen packed up, chatting to Shaolong, as she begins making her way to the Jade Pavilion, where Gyokuyu lives. Just then, Ma Ma spots Jin Shi flirting with several women, only to turn to greet Ma Ma, following up by grazing Ma Ma's hair in an attempt to seduce her, but this only weirds Ma Ma out. Upon arriving at the Jade Pavilion, Ma Ma is greeted by Hong Yong, the head lady in waiting for Gyokuyu, who offers to show Ma Ma around the Jade Pavilion. First visiting Gyokuyu, who warmly welcomes Ma Ma to her new home, remarking that her child Xiao Ling also is happy to see her. Next, Hong Yang shows Ma Ma the guest waiting room, the kitchen and living room where all the ladies in waiting are cleaning. Introducing themselves as Ying Ua, Gai Yuan, Ailin, but when Ma Ma introduces herself, all the girls notice Ma Ma's wrapped up arm. Hong Yang states that there are no service girls in the Jade Pavilion, meaning that the five of them will have to do all of the work around here, but when Ma Ma offers to help them clean up, the ladies stop Ma Ma asking that she rest up for now alluding to a special job that Ma Ma will have to do later on. As Ma Ma leaves, three of the girls begin speculating on Ma Ma's tragic past, collectively shedding a tear for Ma Ma. Showing Ma Ma to her room, Hong Yang instructs Ma Ma to rest until she is summoned. Amazed at the spacious room, Ma Ma is amazed at the promotion, knowing that only elites are normally hired to attend to such royals. That evening, it's revealed that Ma Ma's special role is poison tasting, but Ma Ma can't help but get excited at tasting such luxurious food. Jin Shi reveals it is a serious role as when Yukuyu was pregnant, people had tried to poison her twice, with the food tester being paralyzed after tasting the poisoned food. Starting with the first dish, Ma Ma checks for any distinct marks or scents, only to finally taste the food, noting no numbness and concluding that the first dish is fine. As Ma Ma makes her way through other dishes, 
Ma Mao thinks about how she would run various experiments using poison, when she lived with her father, meaning that she has grown immune to most poisons. That night, Ma Mao advises Gyukuyu to switch the ceramic dishes for silver, as silver will react with most poisons. Amazed, Gyukuyu reveals that they had purposely used ceramic dishes to test Ma Mao's logic, wondering why Ma Mao doesn't reveal that she can read, write and has knowledge in medicine and poisons. Ma Mao states that her kidnappers take most of the money she makes, intriguing Gyokuyu as she knows Ma Mao doesn't want to give the kidnappers any more money. Turning to Ma Mao, Gyokuyu hands Ma Mao a large teapot, dropping it before Ma Mao can grab a hold of it, only to wink at Ma Mao as Gyokuyu states that she'll have to deduct damages out of her normal pay, but since she helped with poison testing earlier, Gyokuyu hands Ma Mao a payment equal to her regular salary, that can't be touched by the kidnappers impressing Ma Mao as it's a loophole that Gyukuyu is using to help her. The next day, Ma Mao is told to once again rest, only called to test meals that may be poison, but easily gets bored. Just then, Ma Mao is called by Gyukuyu and Jinshi, who once again tries to seduce Ma Mao, but no luck. Showing Ma Mao a case of bowsy buns, Jinshi asks for Ma Mao to check the authenticity of the food, but upon smelling the buns, Ma Mao detects an aphrodisiac in the food. Amazed, Jinshi admits that he knew of the aphrodisiac in the food, which weirds Ma Mao out, believing that Jinshi wanted her to eat it, making Gyokuyu laugh. Getting serious, Jinshi reveals that a group of soldiers had reported being poisoned not so long ago, exhibiting signs of nausea, difficulty breathing and other ailments. Due to suspicions, the soldiers had planned to punish the head of the village, but luckily one of the officers convinced otherwise, putting the punishment on hold. Asking if the soldiers ate outside, Ma Ma realizes the cause of the issue, heading to a nearby rhododendron flower to explain. Chewing on one of the flower petals, Ma Ma states that the flower gives the same symptoms listed, but in some cases, wood from trees can cause the same symptoms when burnt, making Jin Shi realize that the soldiers did indeed use wood to start a fire. Relieved that the soldiers didn't harm the innocent villagers, Jinshi wonders if Ma Mao can make him an aphrodisiac. Hearing this, Ma Mao gets excited, knowing that she'll finally get to experiment with making various drugs, replying that she can try given the proper equipment. That night as Jinshi returns to his office, a random concubine attempts to seduce Jinshi, but Jinshi blatantly rejects her offer. Chatting with an eunuch, Jinshi reveals that he has been stationed here by the emperor, to test the loyalty of his concubines, but it's sad to see that most concubines end up betraying the emperor's trust. As Jin Shi thinks about Ma Mao, he admits that Ma Mao is the only girl that is not attracted to him, making Jin Shi curious as to what may convince her otherwise. The next morning, Ma Mao visits the quack doctor, running into Gaoshan, Jin Shi's assistant. As the quack doctor judges Ma Mao for being a mere servant, Gaoshan guides Ma Mao to a storage room, overwhelming Ma Mao as she gets to experiment with all sorts of materials. As Ma Mao is gleefully dancing, Jin Shi interrupts, forcing Ma Mao to get to work. As Ma Mao begins writing up some things, she's amazed at how much paper she gets to use, pleased that Gaoshan is a quick learner compared to Jin Shi who's standing idly by. Upon checking to see if there is enough cacao, Ma Mao is disappointed to see a lack in supply but Jin Shi reassures Ma Mao that he can easily obtain more. Back at the Jade Pavilion, Ma Mao has gathered milk, butter, sugar, honey and powdered cacao, intriguing the other girls, as those are all expensive ingredients. As Hong Yang orders the other girls to stop slacking, we see Ma Mao finally begin to craft the aphrodisiac, stating that she had tasted cacao only once in the past, in the form of chocolate, which is considered an aphrodisiac. With everything mixed, Ma Mao leaves the concoction to harden, but Ma Mao also gets the idea of turning the leftovers into brownies, setting them on a shelf as she cleans up the mess. As Ma Mao passes through the courtyard, she suddenly spots various herbs growing on the field, distracted by the various herbs, only to rush back to the kitchen where she sees everyone waiting for her. Apparently, the three girls had snacked on the brownies, and are now too exhausted to work. Presenting her chocolate and brownies to Gyukuyu and Jinshi, Ma Ma warns that the aphrodisiacs are quite potent, and that they are three times as effective as most stimulants. As Gyukuyu leaves, she remarks that Ma Ma is not knowledgeable with medicine but also can make drugs. 
with Jinshi and Ma Mao alone. Jinshi kisses Ma Mao on the back of her neck, only to leave. That night, we follow a lady walking through the palace, only to spot a mysterious figure high up on the palace walls, malnourished and pale. Cutting back to earlier, we see Jinshi talking with Lady Fuyu, but their conversation ends with Fuyu storming out. That night, a lady is seen dressed in all white, approaching another lady, terrifying the innocent bystander. The next morning, we follow Gyukuyu's three attendants chatting about their lives before serving Gyukuyu, even discussing how trade between western and central capitals is due to Gyukuyu influencing the emperor. The ladies also mention how stressful it was when Gyukuyu was pregnant, as many people were against a princess from a foreign land, giving birth to a child of the emperor. Following, Ma Mao, we see Yingua check up on her, impressed that Ma Mao even knows how to make cold medicine, upon seeing Ma Mao's wrapped up arm. Yingua checks to see if Ma Mao needs any help, reminding Ma Mao that she can vent to her if she needs. Changing topics, Yingua asks if Ma Mao is aware of a spirit haunting the rear palace, intriguing Ma Mao as she asks Shaolan about the rumor. Shaolan states that the ghost lady was sighted a few weeks back, only appearing at night near the Easter castle walls. Ma Mao notes how there are gates on the north, south, east and west of the palace, but each gate is heavily guarded and surrounded by a moat. Shaolan states that the corpse of the ghost lady supposedly exists at the very bottom of the moat, but Ma Mao notes how that is simply a cliché of all ghost stories. Visiting the quack doctor, Ma Mao is amazed that the doctor is now treating her like a normal human being, ever since discovering that she is knowledgeable in medicine as well. When the quack doctor attempts to serve Ma Mao snacks and tea, they are suddenly interrupted by Jin Shi, who asks to join them. As Jin Shi sits beside Ma Mao, Ma Mao wonders what Jin Shi's role in the palace is, thinking dirty thoughts, only to be brought back to reality. As the doctor returns with tea and snacks, Jin Shi sends the doctor away to search for items leaving Jin Shi alone with Ma Mao once again. Now alone, Jin Shi asks Ma Mao about the ghost girl rumor catching Ma Mao's intentions when Jin Shi mentions sleepwalking. Moving in close, Jin Shi asks if Ma Mao can cure sleepwalking, but when Ma Mao states that she doesn't know how, Jin Shi annoys Ma Mao until she agrees to give the problem a go. That night, Gaoshan guides Ma Mao to the eastern palace walls, but on the way asks if Ma Mao can stop glaring at Jin Shi as if he were an insect. Shocked to see that Gaoshan knows of her disgust for Jin Shi, but Gaoshan reveals that Jin Shi tends to fantasize about Ma Mao when he's in his office. As they make it to the eastern wall, Ma Mao is captivated by Lady Fuyu who is dressed in all white, marvelously dancing in front of the moon. The next morning, Ma Mao speaks with the quack doctor, learning that Fuyu was supposed to serve the emperor, but when she had failed to perform in front of the emperor, she chose to shut herself away from the world, ultimately scheduled to be a reward for a military officer. Knowing that she needs more information to cure Fuyu's supposed sleepwalking, Ma Mao asks for directions to Fuyu's room, but before Ma Mao leaves, she learns that Fuyu is from a poor country, which the quack doctor believes that Fuyu doesn't want to go back to. As Ma Mao and Gaoshan spy on Fuyu, Ma Mao is surprised to see Fuyu so timid, reminding her of the Fuyu cotton rose, a flower that remains white during the day, but turns deep pink during night. Returning to Shaolan to ask for any more details, Ma Mao learns that the ghost lady had originally been spotted on the north side of the palace, but has since moved to the east. Believing that she has found the solution, she wonders if she should operate on solely speculations, but still chooses to present her findings to Gyukuyu and Jinshi. Ma Mao starts by recounting a tale of a concubine that lived in the town near her village, being a cheerful and skilled poet at first, but upon learning that she would be bought, had purposely acted demonic to avoid being bought. Additionally, Ma Mao adds that the person attempting to purchase the lady was a wealthy merchant that had a wife and kid. Hearing this, Gyukuyu wonders if Fuyu was the same, but Jinshi smirks, asking if Ma Mao is telling them everything she knows. With nothing else to add, Ma Mao states that since that day, Fuyu had been forbidden to leave her room, but Ma Mao hopes that everything works out. As days pass by, people start noticing Ma Mao more quiet than usual, leading all the way until the day of Fuyu's departure with her assigned military officer. Having a private chat with Ma Mao, Gyukuyu asks for Ma Mao's true answer to Fuyu's sleepwalking, convincing Ma Mao to reveal the rest of her solution. Apparently, 
Ma Mao believes that the military officer and Fuyu are childhood friends, having heard reports of the military officer insisting on Fuyu as his reward. Ma Mao hypothesizes that Lady Fuyu had purposely failed at her dance performance in front of the emperor, to avoid any attention. Next Fuyu had faked her sleepwalking symptoms, as a way to devalue herself as a woman and give people reasons to get her out of the palace. Finally, Lady Fuyu's dance on the Easter palace walls was most likely her way of praying for her military childhood friend to return safely from the eastern battlefields. As Fuyu leaves the palace, she shows her relief to finally reunite with her childhood friend, showing that Ma Mao's deductions were spot on. That evening, Ma Mao is seen wondering what it must be like to fall in love, but at the same time, Gaoshan asks Gyukuyu a favor involving Ma Mao. Cutting to Ma Mao, we see several of Liwa's ladies in waiting scolding Ma Mao, having pushed Ma Mao down, and begun berating Ma Mao for trying to feed Lahua such disgusting food. Flashing back, we see that the emperor is visiting Gyokuyu, having Ma Mao taste the food for poison. But before Ma Mao can leave, after confirming that the food is not poisoned, she's surprised to see the emperor personally ask for a favor. Apparently, the emperor had asked for Ma Mao to solve and cure the Lahua, as Lahua is acting strange, and since it's a request directly from the emperor, Ma Mao has no reason to refuse. Cutting back to the present, Ma Mao begins cleaning up the spilled food she had made for Lahua, only to be kicked out by Liwa's lady in waiting. Having lunch with Shaolan, Ma Mao tells Shaolan about Liwa's sick state, reasoning that the white powder must still be running through her body, but luckily the white powder along with the flower that it has come from has been banned from the rear palace. Shaolan is amazed that Ma Mao was personally asked by the emperor to cure his concubine but Ma Mao notes how strange it is that the emperor is asking her instead of the quack doctor, finishing up her meal, only to head to the kitchen. Knowing that she needs to expel the existing poison from Liwa's body, Ma Mao decides to create a better-looking porridge, but gets refused and kicked out by Liwa's lady-in-waiting. Trying once again, Ma Mao has no luck, but catches a glimpse of Liwa's normal prestigious meal, noting how the food may be delicious, but it's way too heavy for a sick person to be eating. As Ma Mao is kicked out, we see Jin Shi off to the side observing her, watching as Ma Mao continues to try and serve Lahua, but her ladies in waiting continue to refuse Ma Mao's help. One day as Ma Mao tries to bring food to Lahua, Jin Shi appears, asking if Ma Mao needs any help, but seeing Ma Mao defeated, Jin Shi charms Liwa's lady in waiting, allowing Ma Mao to finally serve Lahua a porridge. Slowly feeding Lahua the porridge, Ma Mao is happy to see that Lahua can still digest food on her own, but as Ma Mao wipes a stain from Liwa's face, she realizes that Lahua is covered in a white powder, similar to the poisonous one that had been banned. Getting serious, Ma Mao walks to the leader of the ladies-in-waiting, demanding to know who was in charge of applying the white powder to Lahua. When one of the leaders steps up, remarking that she was the one, Ma Mao slaps the lady to the ground, dragging her towards the draw, where she finds the poisonous powder. Dumping the powder on the lady, Ma Ma reiterates that the powder is poison, and that the lady's cocky know-it-all attitude is causing Lahua to slowly die. As Ma Ma orders Liwa's ladies in waiting to clean up the white powder, Jin Shi can't help but admire Ma Ma's serious sudden tone, which Ma Ma quickly corrects. Getting to work, Ma Ma diluted her porridge, as Lahua is in worse condition than she thought. Next, Ma Mao opened up windows, to allow ventilation, as the incense set up by the Liwa's ladies were simply making it hard for Lahua to breathe. Ma Mao also orders Liwa's ladies to help wipe down and clean Lahua, only for Ma Mao to hydrate Lahua with tea to help flush out any toxins within Liwa's body. With Ma Mao spending more time taking care of Lahua, Lahua started to recover, allowing Ma Mao to begin adding fruits to the meal. As Ma Mao continues to take care of Lahua, it's revealed that the leader of the ladies in the meeting was punished and confined, having hid the poisonous powder from everyone. Checking up on Ma Mao, Janishi unveils a little treat for Ma Mao, who pleasantly accepts the gift, munching on the meal, but knows that the gift was from Gaoshan. Jinshi asks Ma Mao if they can help with Liwa's recovery, prompting Ma Mao to ask Jinshi to begin constructing a steam bath, stating that sweating will help Lahua as well. Returning to Liwa's side, Ma Mao suddenly hears Lahua speaking, leaning in close to hear Lahua ask why Ma Mao is helping her, stating that she doesn't want to live. 
Mama reveals that she knows Lahua doesn't want to die, prompting Lahua to agree, as she thinks about the memories she had with her baby. With days passing by, we see Mama help fuel the steam bath, where Lahua is instructed to sit in. Afterwards, Lahua is taken to her room cleaned off and fed, only for Liwa's ladies to help Mama clean off and dry Liwa's dirty sheets. That evening, the leader of Liwa's ladies had returned from confinement, declaring that she'll be taking over Liwa's recovery and promising to never mess up again. Hesitant to speak to Lahua, the leader of the ladies is relieved, seeing how much Lahua has recovered. With two months passing, Ma Ma is happy to report that Lahua is recovering well, even able to wander the palace gardens all by herself. Seeing Lahua admire the garden's flowers, Ma Ma admits that she thought Lahua would be arrogant and rude after the loss of her child, but it seems as if Lahua has accepted the loss, making Ma Ma realize how pleasant of a lady Lahua truly is. As Ma Ma rests for the day, we see Lahua sit by her side, silently thanking Ma Ma for her help. With Ma Ma's final day attending to Lahua, Ma Ma reports that she has told Liwa's ladies in waiting how to proceed with Liwa's diet, pleasing Lahua. Before Ma Ma leaves, Lahua asks Ma Ma if she's capable of having another child, believing that the emperor no longer loves her, but Ma Ma reveals that she was personally sent here by the emperor to make sure Lahua lives. Seeing Lahua still worried she'll lose the emperor to Gyokuyu, Ma Ma reminds Lahua that she has assets that exceed Gyokuyu whispering a technique that Lahua can perform that may impress the emperor in bed. As Ma Ma leaves, she reveals that she had learned the technique from the ladies from her village when she was younger. Finally arriving back at the Jade Pavilion, Gyokuyu and the other ladies are glad to see Ma Ma back, but that night, we cut to several men tossing trash into a fire. Out of nowhere, the fire erupts, changing into different colors that end up burning one of the men, who believes that he's been cursed. Sitting down and observing his wounds, the man begins to break down, terrified of the curse, but just then we cut to Jin Shi on his morning training. Able to out-trade Basin, Jin Shi commends his fellow eunuch, as Basin has greatly improved his swordplay. Getting cleaned off, Jin Shi asks Gaoshan about Ma Mao, happy to hear that Ma Mao is recovering well, ever since returning to the Jade Pavilion. Cutting to Ma Mao, we see her digging through a garden, ecstatic to finally find some rare mushrooms, wondering where she should hide them. Just then, Ma Ma remembers that she has something to do, heading over to deliver Shaolan some spare meals that Ma Ma was gifted. Sparking up a conversation, Shaolan asks if Ma Ma had heard of a palace servant seducing a military officer, revealing that the servant had used an aphrodisiac, reminding Ma Ma of the chocolates she had created. Heading over to the quack doctor, Ma Ma reveals the Matsutake mushrooms she's dug up, exciting the quack doctor. As they both start grilling the mushrooms, they both secretly enjoy the delectable taste of the mushrooms, but just then, a man barges into the room asking if the quack doctor can cure his curse. Inspecting the man's burnt hands, Ma Ma offers to make an ointment for the burns, all whilst the man recounts what happened. The man says that two nights ago, he was burning trash by the east side of the palace as he normally would, only to stumble onto a discarded women's dress that had both sleeves burnt off and several wooden tablets. Knowing that he shouldn't waste time, the man simply tossed the dress and tablets into the fire, but out of nowhere, the fire began changing colors, and next thing he knew his hands were burnt. Seeing the man in utter shock, Ma Ma takes out a stick, lighting it on fire, only to sprinkle chemicals to make the flame change color. When the man confirms that the color of the flames were the exact same, Ma Ma states that chemicals are similar to what they use for fireworks, and as for the marks on the man's hand, Ma Ma reasons it's probably due to the man growing a rash from the wood. As Ma Ma hands the man an ointment, the man expresses his gratitude, but just then Jin Shi appears, prompting the quack doctor to leave and prepare tea for Jin Shi. Seeing such a happy smile on Jin Shi's face, Ma Ma gets annoyed, asking what Jin Shi wants, but Jin Shi gets serious asking Ma Ma to come with him. Setting up chemicals in front of Ma Ma, Jin Shi asks Ma Ma how many colors he can make with the chemicals and how to apply them. Ma Ma states she's not too sure, but she knows some chemicals can be dissolved in oil and some in water. Before Ma Ma can leave, Jin Shi asks for the chemicals to be teapot steamed, shocking Ma Ma, as Jin Shi had found out she was hiding something. As Ma Ma leaves, 
Jinshi orders Gaoshan to find everyone that had suffered rashes from holding wooden tablets, but Ma Mao knows that the wooden tablets were most likely used to decode a secret message. Heading back to the Jade Pavilion, Ma Mao wonders why everyone is in a rush, forced to try on a dress, only to learn that twice a year a garden party is held for the emperor and the high officials. On top of the emperor, his four upper-ranking concubines, the prestigious consort, Gyokyu, the wise consort, Lahua, the virtuous consort, Li Shu and the pure consort A Duo. Hong Yang states that last time, Lahua and Gyokuyu couldn't attend due to giving birth, but this time, Gyokuyu will be showing off her child, Princess Lingli for the first time. Knowing that she can't skip out on attending, knowing that she'll have to help taste Gyokuyu's food, Ma Mao asks for Hong Nang's help getting ready for the party. Hong Yan states that they'll have to pad up Ma Mao a bit, remove her freckles and apply makeup. With Ma Mao dreading having to smile at the high-ranking officials and stand in the cold wind, Ma Mao gets an idea, rushing to prepare things. That night, Hong Yang checks up on Ma Mao, seeing that Ma Mao has cooked up some orange and ginger snacks to help warm up the guests. When Ma Mao shows off an additional layer she sewed onto her dress to keep hand warmers, Hong Yan begs Ma Mao to do the save for the other girls. Ma Mao immediately gets to work. As word spread of Ma Mao's pocket warmer trick and orange snack, Jin Shi and Gaoshan ended up visiting, along with the emperor's seamstress and cook, asking to learn Ma Mao's techniques. With several days going by, Ma Mao rushes to prepare and learn everything needed for the garden party, managing to finish preparations the day before, but at the same time, Gaoshan reports that he hasn't been able to track down any other victims that have been received burnt marks like the cursed man. With the big day arriving, Ma Mao and the ladies all gather around Gyokuyu, stunned at Gyokuyu's crimson beauty. As a token of appreciation, Gyokuyu lends a piece of jewelry to each of her ladies in waiting, reminding Ma Mao that she is now part of her family. Just then, the ladies grab hold of Ma Mao, beginning to transform Ma Mao into a true woman, but as one of the ladies cleans off Ma Mao's face, they all stop and gather around Ma Mao's face. With all four princesses entering the assigned area, we see Jin Shi greeting all the princesses, managing to charm Li Shu, heading to greet Gyokuyu last. As Jin Shi greets Gyokuyu, he notes how Gyokuyu's crimson outfit and her jade eyes complement each other. But spotting Ma Mao to the side, Jin Shi attempts to tease her a bit, but is stunned to see Ma Mao's gorgeous face. Having not recognized her, Jin Shi compliments Ma Mao for applying makeup and removing her freckles, but Ma Mao reveals that she never had freckles to begin with. Finding it strange that Ma Mao would fake her freckles, Jin Shi is shocked to learn that back in Ma Mao's village, men would prey on any women they can. But by faking freckles, Ma Mao would never be attacked or assaulted due to her ugly looks and childlike figure. Additionally, Jin Shi learns that Ma Mao was kidnapped from her village, apologizing for something so sad to happen to such a talent like Ma Mao. Ma Mao states that it isn't Jin Shi's fault, but Jin Shi pulls Ma Mao close giving Ma Mao his hairpin, only to leave. As other ladies voice their jealousy at Ma Mao, Gyokuyu approaches Ma Mao, uttering that Ma Mao no longer belongs to a single person. Before Ma Mao can learn what that means, the garden party begins, overwhelming Ma Mao as the sheer scale of the party is unimaginable. But at the same time as the food for the guest is served, we cut to an ominous silhouette. As the garden party unfolds, we cut to Ma Mao and the other ladies all clinging to each other as the cold wind brushes past them. Peeking through the curtains, Ma Mao notes how the arrangement of the four concubines encourages rivalry. Looking around, Ma Mao spots Empress Dowager, having given birth to the emperor and the emperor's younger brother at a very young age. Sadly, the emperor's younger brother couldn't make the party, supposedly being too sick to leave the house. Just then, Ma Mao overhears some of the leader Li Wu's ladies making fun of her friends, watching as Ying Yue gets more and more angry. Ma Mao thinks back on when she was taking care of Li Hua. Ma Mao was easily able to scare Li Wu's attendants, but seeing Li Wu's attendants making fun of her friends, Ma Mao reminds Li Wu's attendants of what she can do to them, scaring them off. As Ma Mao reminds her friends that she needs to change their hand warmers, the Gyokuyu's ladies can't help but admire Ma Mao always being so nice even after having such a tragic past. Just then, Ah Duo's attendants and Lishu's attendants begin to bicker, 
which Maamao learns that consort Li Shu is only 14 and Aduo is already 35, being the oldest of the four consorts. Additionally, Li Shu used to be the daughter-in-law of Aduo, as Aduo used to be a concubine of the previous emperor, whilst Li Shu was a concubine of the current. But since the previous emperor passed away five years ago, Aduo became a concubine of the current emperor. Amazed that Li Shu was only nine to be a concubine, Ma Mao realized she was mistaken, as Li Shu was in fact A Duo's mother-in-law. As Hong Yan passes Gyokuyu's child to Ma Mao, they both notice Li Shu passing by, both bowing their heads, as Li Shu cockily walks past. Hong Yan states that Li Shu is very young, as a virtuous consort like Li Shu would normally wear white, but instead Li Shu chose to wear a dark pink, a color similar to Gyokuyu's crimson red. As Hong Yan leaves, Ma Mao spots several girls freezing cold, offering the girls to hold some coals to warm them up, but this only weirds them out. As Ma Mao returns to her friends, they start teasing Ma Mao for sharing her hand warmer trick with other consorts' attendants, but Ma Mao suddenly spots a man handing his hairpin to a girl. Seeing Ma Mao intrigued, one of her friends mentions that fighting one hairpin is how men recruit ladies, but Ma Mao's friend also alludes to a second meaning. As Ma Mao leaves for some fresh air, a man, Li Haku, stops her, offering his hairpin. Seeing that Li Haku has got several other pins, Ma Mao is happy to receive a hairpin, but just then Lahua appears, prompting Ma Mao and the other attendants to greet her. As a gift, Lahua personally hands Ma Mao a hairpin as well, shocking the other girls as they wonder if Gyokuyu will be okay with Ma Mao garnering so much attention. With Ma Mao now preparing to test the food for poison, Ma Mao spots Gaoshan in the crowd, amazed that he is quite high ranking. Also, Ma Mao spots Li Haku is also quite high ranking, but wonders where Jin Shi is compared to the others. With the first soup dish served, Ma Mao notes that there is no strange clouding appear, along with no peculiar smell from the soup. Upon drinking the soup, Ma Mao chases the soup with some water, confirming nothing strange with the dish, but upon seeing another fellow food taster so stressed, Ma Mao feels sorry for them, noting how she must be the only one that yearns for the taste of poison. Up next is a vinegar fish and vegetable dish, a favorite of the emperors, but instead of blue back fish there is jellyfish. With nothing too outlandish, Ma Mao pans over to see Li Shu sweating at the thought of eating fish, but forces herself to eat it as she is in public. But as she looks at Li Shu's food taster, Ma Mao spots the food taster smirking whilst staring at L. Ishu. At the same time, one of Li Haku's friends asks Li Haku to watch one of the food tasters, realizing that it is Ma Mao from earlier. Slowly watching as Ma Mao slowly slurps and enjoys the next dish, but as Ma Mao finishes enjoying the dish, she declares that the dish she just tasted was poisoned, quickly walking off. As Jin Shi begins slowly walking to the stage, he makes it just in time to see another person collapse from tasting the dish, but spots Ma Mao running off somewhere. Checking up on Ma Mao, Jin Shi is shocked to see Ma Mao so happy, grabbing and dragging her to the infirmary. Ma Mao notes how she would have loved to swallow the poison, but states that the poison would have easily paralyzed her, but hearing this, Jin Shi gets weirded out. Jin Shi states that another official had tried the dish themselves, making Ma Mao wonder what idiot would do so offering to give Jinshi a bag of drugs that will help the people poison to throw up and get the poison out of their systems. Accepting the drugs, Jinshi continues to drag Ma Mao along, but Ma Mao notes how Jinshi has gotten a new hairpin, wondering why he wasn't at the party until now. Upon reaching the palace infirmary, Ma Mao is instructed to vomit the rest of the food in her stomach, ultimately impressed by the palace's drugs. Moving on to a more serious topic, Jin Shi wants to know if Ma Mao suspects the person that may have wanted to poison Gyokuyu, but Ma Mao asks for Jin Shi to bring Li Shu. Being able to charm Li Shu into coming, Jin Shi introduces Li Shu and her food taster to Ma Mao. Spotting Li Shu scratching herself, Ma Mao rushes to unveil her dress, spotting rashes scattered along Li Shu's arm. Ma Mao confirms that Li Shu is indeed allergic to fish, commenting how she herself is allergic to buckwheat and could never build up a tolerance to it. Asking if Li Shu is handling the fish okay, Ma Mao states that the vinegar fish dish she tasted earlier had jellyfish, meaning that Lady Gyokuyu's dishes and Lady Li Shu's dishes were swapped. Upon confirming that Li Shu is allergic to mackerel, 
Ma Ma glares at Li Shu's food taster, speculating that although the food taster knew Li Shu was allergic to mackerel, she still allowed Li Shu to eat a dish with mackerel. Having written up several other foods that Li Shu should avoid, Ma Ma personally hands Li Shu's food taster the list, glaring and warning the food taster to not act out, or else she may disappear. With Jin Shi asking Ma Ma what just happened, Ma Ma faints ignorance, but before Ma Ma leaves, she states that there may have been other attempts at poisoning. Now alone, Gaoshan asks Jin Shi if the poisoning is somehow related to the wooden tablets, alluding to a lady in waiting that visited earlier not having any burns on her hands. The next morning, Ma Ma is seen dreaming of her father, wondering if he's all right. Apparently, after the party, the other attendants ordered Ma Ma to get plenty of rest ultimately leading to Ma Ma sleeping until noon. Reporting to Gyokuyu, Ma Ma apologizes for sleeping in, but Gyokuyu states that Ma Ma could have taken the day off. Upon seeing Ma Ma's face, Gyokuo wonders why Ma Ma has added freckles to her face, but Ma Ma states she's more comfortable with them on. Changing topics, Gyokuyu tells Ma Ma that Gaoshin has been wanting to speak with Ma Ma, a sign to pluck some weed in the meantime. Greeting Gaoshin, Ma Mao hears that Jin Shi wanted to give Ma Mao the poisonous soup in the cup Gyokuyu was supposed to drink. Upon confirming that no one has touched the silver cup up until now, Ma Mao heads to retrieve some cotton, powder and a brush. Taking some cotton and dabbing it in the powder, Ma Mao begins patting the silver cup with the powder, brushing off the excess to reveal some fingerprints. Ma Mao reveals that the oils that excrete from the human body easily stain silver, hence why silver utensils are cleaned thoroughly. Suddenly realizing something about Li Shu and her food taster, Ma Ma quickly hides her realization, explaining to Gaoshan that four people in total touched the silver cup. Since they already know that someone must have poured, carried and tasted the soup, it leads Ma Ma to assume that the fourth person must be the one to have poisoned the soup. Hearing this, Gaoshan wonders why Li Shu's food taster is touching Gyokuyu's dish, but Ma Ma reveals that Lishu's food taster had swapped Lishu's and Gyukuyu's dishes to bully Lishu. Shocked that a lady in waiting will bully a high ranking concubine, Gaoshan listens to Ma Ma's reasoning, learning that Lishu's lady in waitings must have personally recommended Lishu to wear a similar color to Gyokuyu, only to purposely wear white themselves, making Lishu seem childish and disrespectful towards Gyokuyu. Sadly, Ma Ma knows that concubines can only rely and trust their ladies in waiting. But for Li Shu, it seems that the people she can trust the most are nothing but bullies. The bright side was that, since Ma Mao tasted the poison meant for Li Shu, Ma Mao was able to save Li Shu's life. When Gaoshan wonders what would have caused the ladies in waiting to turn on L Ishu, Ma Mao suspects that the ladies are not only jealous that Li Shu was able to become a concubine to the previous emperor at such a young age. But they also believe the Li Shu is disgusting for choosing to leech off the existing emperor after the previous emperor passed away. Seeing as the mysterious fourth person's fingerprints are near the edge, Ma Mao suspects it to be another lady in waiting, but before Ma Mao leaves, Gaoshan asks why Ma Mao didn't reveal Licious Food Taster's crime of swapping and bullying Li Shu. Surprised that Gaoshan found out, Ma Mao reveals that she knows how rough it is to be a food taster. So Ma Ma reasons that remaining Lishu's food taster is enough of a punishment. Reporting to Jin Shi on his findings, Jin Shi praises Gaoshan for getting the truth out from Ma Ma, but complains that he hasn't gotten any time to rest, as he's trying to figure out the culprit. Choosing to rest at his desk, Gaoshan reminds Jin Shi to act more professional, but ends up helping Jin Shi to remove his hairpin, something only a special individual can wear. As Gaoshan leaves for the night, Jin Shi perks up, stating that he can finally get to work. The next day, Ma Mao sits with Shaolan who is excited to hear that Ma Mao received several hairpins, mentioning that Ma Mao can finally leave the rear palace. Shocked to hear this, Ma Mao learns that with a hairpin, Ma Mao can as the hairpin owner to assist Ma Mao temporarily or permanently leave the rear palace. Seeing as there is really only one man she can turn to, we cut to Lihaku who is busy training, stopping as he has received a message from Ma Mao wondering how he should turn her down, having only given out the pins as a formality. Choosing to privately chat with Ma Mao, Li Haku is shocked to see Ma Mao as completely different without makeup, but asks why Ma Mao had summoned him. Upon hearing that Ma Mao would like Li Haku to vouch for her to visit her home, Li Haku gets pissed, 
wondering what Ma Mao can give in exchange. As a trump card, Ma Mao reveals that she has special vouchers to the Verdigris house, a super-renowned brothel that would normally take up on years' worth of Lihaku's salary. Seeing Lihaku hesitant at first, Ma Mao chooses to play hard to get, taking back the vouchers only to show off two of her other hairpins. Upon realizing that the two other pins are far superior than his, Lihaku has no choice but to accept Ma Mao's offer, fearing that he'll never get a chance like this again. Reporting the good news to Gyokuyu and the other girls, Ma Mao promises to bring back souvenirs, but Gyokuyu and Hongina note how Ma Mao probably doesn't know the full extent of what the hairpin means. As Ma Mao leaves, we see Jin Shi finding out that Ma Mao had left the rear palace with another man, but Gyokuyu adds that it'll only be for three days. With Ma Mao and Lihaku traveling by carriage, Ma Mao reveals that the town near her village is renowned as the Pleasure District, with the three princesses of the Verdigris house idolized by the whole country. Upon arriving at the entrance of the Verdigris house, Ma Mao rushes to hug Granny, but instead receives a swift blow to her stomach. Ma Mao reassures Lihaku that she's fine, as Granny used to perform the trick to allow Ma Mao to spit out all the poison she would test and consume. Happy to see Lihaku has lots of muscles, Granny assigns Lihaku Perrin, finally alone with Ma Mao. Wondering why Ma Mao left for 10 months, Ma Mao states that she had sent a letter, which the Granny confirms she got, that's why she chose to service Lihaku for a discount. Taking out the money she earned at the rear palace, Ma Mao apologizes for not making enough to afford Perrin, but Granny states that Ma Mao simply needs to bring in more young guests like Lihaku, so they can squeeze them for all their money. As Granny leaves, she tells Ma Mao to quickly return to her father, heading back down the street that she grew up on. Upon entering her father's home, Ma Mao spots her father doing the same thing as when she left, sitting down and telling her father stories of her time at the rear palace. Telling her father that she'll need to return in two days' time, Ma Mao chooses to rest for the night, but as Ma Mao sleeps, her father reveals that he has connections with the rear palace. The next morning, Ma Mao wakes up, remembering that she is home, but notes how she is quite sweaty. Seeing that her father isn't home, Ma Mao reasons that her father is probably out in the herb field, wishing that her father would stop working at his age. Just then, a little girl begins banging on her home, prompting Ma Mao to approach her and ask what's the problem. Without saying anything, the little girl grabs Ma Mao, dragging her into the house, where she sees a crowd forming in front of a room. Upon entering the room, Ma Mao is stunned to see two people incapacitated, but snapping out of the daze, Ma Mao gets to work, assessing the situation. Seeing as the man isn't breathing and the woman is barely breathing, Ma Mao orders another helper to check if the lady has anything clogging the throats. With Ma Mao and the helper applying CPR to both people, Ma Mao orders the little girl to bring charcoal. With Ma Mao managing to resuscitate the two, Ma Mao cleans out her mouth, sarcastically remarking that it's great to be home. As Ma Mao asks the house's ladies to not touch anything within the room, Ma Mao begins inspecting the room, noting how the two victims were a courtesan and a customer. Upon entering the room, Ma Mao picked up scents of alcohol and tobacco, also spotting two bottles, some broken glass, wheat stalks, a pipe and some tobacco. With the little girl arriving with the charcoal Ma Mao had asked for, Ma Mao asks for something to write on, giving the little girl a message, asking the little girl to go fetch her father's in the herb field. As the little girl leaves, she gives Ma Mao a dark stare, but as the little girl returns with Ma Mao's father, Ma Mao reports that she has crushed the charcoal and it should be ready to be mixed with herbs to treat the two victims. Following the courtesan, we see that she has gotten better, learning that the male customer is also now stable. With Ma Mao and her father alone, Ma Mao reveals that her father is quite smart, able to piece together things with simple clues. Asking Ma Mao to sit with him, Ma Mao's father tests Ma Mao, asking what she thought caused everything. Ma Mao states that she believes the tobacco leaves are quite poisonous, being commonly used for suicides, which her father confirms is true. Asking if Ma Mao had them drink water, Ma Mao states that she didn't which her father commends, as the stomach acid can prevent poison from being absorbed, but when water is added, it makes it easier for the human stomach to absorb the poison. Next, Ma Mao's father pokes a hole in Ma Mao's deduction, asking what if the tobacco leaves were soaked in water beforehand, prompting Ma Mao to confirm that there are no leaves in the vomit, 
meaning that diluting the poison with water may have actually been better. As the owner of the house thanks Ma Mao and her father, Ma Mao sees that the wheat stalks are used to drink liquids without messing up one's lipstick. As a thanks, the owner pays Ma Mao and her father, but when Ma Mao's father attempts to decline the payment, Ma Mao reminds her father that he has to pay for rent. Ma Mao notes how the man and women must have attempted a double suicide, as it's not too uncommon for something to occur, as usually poor men and unhappy courtesan would agree to take their own lives. Ma Mao finds it weird that the man who wears such expensive clothes would choose to take his own life, but just then Ma Mao spots the little girl visiting the man, reasoning that she too should check up on the man as well. Upon entering the room, Ma Mao is horrified to see the little girl attempting to stab the man, swiftly disarming the girl. Hearing the little girl scream that the man deserves to die, Ma Mao headbutts the little girl, forcing her onto her knees. But just then, a lady arrives, asking to speak privately with Ma Mao. The lady reveals that the man poisoned was quite a problematic customer, always flirting and promising to purchase and give women a better life, only to lie and dump the girls. Having been stabbed and poisoned in the past, the man comes from a rich merchant, ultimately choosing to resolve issues with money. It's revealed that the man did the same thing to the little girl's older sister, but it turns out the older sister had fallen for the scummy man. The concubine that was poisoned is apparently friends with the little girl's sister, and had tried a double suicide with the man. Since they can't ban the man, as it would be bad for business, they have no choice but to leave him as is. As Ma Mao and her father head home, Ma Mao thinks about how scary the little girl is, having specifically ran to search for her father, which she probably knew wasn't home, instead of going to search for an actual doctor. Returning home, Ma Mao asks to check the money they were paid, confirming that the owner paid them to stay quiet about what happened. Still unable to figure out why a man that had been poisoned previously would be so easily poisoned, but before Ma Mao can conclude anything, her father reminds Ma Mao to only consider facts. Diving back through all the points she knows, Ma Mao concludes that it wasn't a double suicide but in fact poison. But before she can tell her father, her father tells Ma Mao that the cases is already over. As Ma Mao walks through town, she explains that the courtesan must have poisoned the man, using two types of liquid. Since the man would want her to taste any drink before he did, the courtesan must have poured edible liquid and a non-edible liquid into the same cup, but due the liquid's different densities, the edible and non-edible liquids would form their own layers. The courtesan simply drank from the bottom edible liquid with a straw, whereas the man would drink the poison. Afterwards, the lady would sip a little of the poison, just enough for her to survive. But some things still don't make sense, as Ma Ma wonders if the little girl knew what the courtesan was doing as she purposely didn't want a doctor to come, or if the owner knew what was happening and purposely paid for their silence. Knowing that she can't operate on speculation, Ma Ma makes her way to the Verdigris house, using its bath to clean up. Just then, Mei Mei joins Ma Ma, revealing that Granny, herself and other princesses were worried about her. That night, Ma Ma is seen visiting the annex, falling asleep as she sits beside someone sleeping. With the three days already over, Ma Ma's father wishes her well, heading over to pick up Lihaku who has already been ensnared by Perrin. Returning to the Jade Pavilion, Ma Ma can't help but notice Jin Shi's glare from behind, but before Ma Ma can flee, Jin Shi asks to speak with her privately. Seeing Jin Shi so agitated, Ma Ma asks what is agitating him, but Jin Shi instead asks how Ma Ma's visit home was. Upon hearing that nothing happened with Lihaku, Jin Shi asks if Ma Ma knows what choosing Lihaku as a guarantor means, but Ma Ma says she believes a guarantor is a high ranking official with a good record. Seeing Jin Shi at a loss for words, Ma Ma states that she didn't want to rely on Jin Shi, fearing that she could never repay him, like she did Lihaku. Hearing this, Jin Shi believes that she gave up her body to convince Li Haku, but as Ma Mao leaves, we see Hong Nyan rushing to slap Ma Mao for being misleading, all whilst Gyokuyu laughs at what they heard. Cutting to the cafeteria area at night, we see several eunuchs gathered for dinner, but as they all chat they all suddenly hear a massive ceramic container shatter, followed by a drunk older eunuch demanding that they bring him more booze. Seeing the older man in a pathetic state, Several eunuchs laugh at how thanks to him, they'll probably never drink. Suddenly we see a mysterious man placing some mysterious substance in some bottles of booze, only to hand it to the older man, 
coldly watching as the older man gulps down the spiked booze. The next morning, Gao Shen asks for Jin Shi to stop sulking, reminding Jin Shi that he still has lots of work to do. Gao Shen thinks about how Jin Shi has accomplished a lot in his life, seeing unusual for Jin Shi to act so childish and be so attached to another person's life. As Gao Shen hands Jin Shi some paperwork, Gao Shen thinks about how he managed to convince Gyokuyu to explain to Jin Shi that it wasn't Ma Mao that offered her body to Lihaku but instead Ma Mao asked another experienced lady to repay the favor. Still Gao Shen admits how unlucky it was for Jin Shi to put so much effort, freeing up time to mess with Ma Mao, only to hear that Ma Mao left to spend time with another man. As Jin Shi and Gao Shen begin working through the papers, they both note how nobles try to pass bills to benefit themselves, but it's ultimately up to Jin Shi to verify them. As they both work on the papers all throughout the day and into the night, they are suddenly interrupted by an eunuch, revealing that Sir Conan has passed away. The next morning, Jin Shi reports the bad news to Gyokuyu and Ma Mao, both sad to hear that a high-ranking man had passed away. As Ma Mao hears that Conan had drunk himself to death, Ma Mao has no sympathy for him, but Jin Shi suddenly asks if Ma Mao thinks Conan truly drank himself to death. Speaking with Jin Shi, Ma Ma reiterates that heavy drinking does ultimately poison and weaken one's organs, explaining Conan's death, but Jin Shi tells Ma Ma that Conan was celebrating during a party by drinking out with friends. Wondering why Jin Shi would tell her that, Jin Shi adds that Conan easily handled his alcohol, but he wasn't liked by many people. Taking out some booze, Jin Shi pours Ma Ma a cup of booze, exciting Ma Ma but Jin Shi adds that unfortunately the last jar of booze Conan drank from was shattered and the booze was lost. Seeing Jin Shi so sad, Ma Ma reasons that with the information Jin Shi told her, there is no way of finding out if Conan was poisoned or not. Taking a sip of the booze, Ma Ma is disgusted by the sweet and salty flavors, but Jin Shi reveals that Conan loved sweet foods, never touching even the most valuable of smoked meats or rarest of rock salts. Reminiscing Jin Shi states that Conan used to love spicy food but one day switched to loving sweet foods, but Ma Mao interrupts, wondering if Conan passed due to diabetes. As Ma Mao takes another sip, she learns that there were rock salts, mooncakes and dried meat at the party, prompting Ma Mao to request to see the last drinking jar Conan touched before he passed. Jin Shi states the jar is shattered, but Ma Mao states she still wants to see it, finishing up several more cups of booze, only to mention that she has an idea of what happened. The next day, Ma Mao greets Jin Shi, who has brought the shattered jar, along with Gao Shen handing Ma Mao a report on the incident. Reading through the report, Ma Mao heads towards the shattered jar, licking off a dried off some substance from the jar, shocking Gao Shen and Jin Shi. Reassuring them that she's fine, Ma Mao drops some of the leftover substance in a fire, revealing that the jar had an overabundance of salt in it ultimately poisoning Conan. Wondering how Conan didn't stop drinking such a salty beverage, Ma Mao hands Jin Shi the report, deducing that Conan must have lost his ability to taste salty things. Apparently, Kun was quite a talented and smart bureaucrat, but unfortunately he had lost his wife and child to an epidemic, choosing to escape by drinking and consuming sweets. Ma Mao states that Conan's inability to taste salty things is a form of illness that stems from an unbalanced diet or stress. Hearing all of this, Jin Shi asks Ma Mao who could have placed salt in Conan's drink, but Ma Mao states that she has no idea. Ma Mao does add that the booze she tasted yesterday had salt, so it could have been someone that didn't like sweet drinks, or it could have been co-workers that tried pranking Conan but simply took it too far, and poisoned Conan. Hearing all this, Jin Shi whispers something to Gao Shen, sending him off, but at the same time, Ma Mao thinks about how she doesn't want to reveal the culprit, fearing that she'll get someone punished, but notes how she had given Jin Shi enough clues already. As Jin Shi thanks Ma Mao for the insight, Ma Mao spots an obsidian tassel tied to Jin Shi's waist, asking how close Jin Shi was to Conan. Jin Shi reveals that Conan was crucial to him, when Jin Shi was a child, making Ma Mao feel sorry for Jin Shi. As a thanks for all the help, Jin Shi gives Ma Mao a bottle of booze, exciting Ma Mao, but as Jin Shi tries to tease Ma Mao, Ma Mao fires back, teasing Jin Shi for slacking on his paperwork. Backed into a corner, Jin Shi mentions how he has the ability to pass a law that forbids underage drinking until the age of 20 years old, 
finally getting Ma Mao to concede their little dispute. As several days pass, we see a mysterious lady suddenly being flung into a body of water, helplessly left to drown. The next day, Ma Mao and the quack doctor are called to inspect the body of the victim, impressing Ma Mao as the corpse had been preserved due to the cold weather. Asking about the victim, Ma Mao learns that the victim was most likely a servant from the rear palace and her body was found in the moat surrounding the palace, but gets thrown off seeing how scared the quack doctor is. Too scared to touch the body, the quack doctor asks if Ma Mao can search and touch the body, but Ma Mao states that her teacher forbade Ma Mao from touching corpses. Just then, Jin Shi appears, asking Ma Mao more on the reason she can't touch corpses, but Ma Mao shyly remarks that humans can become ingredients as well, and her father had foresaw Ma Mao experimenting with human corpses, forbidding Ma Mao from doing something so inhumane. As the quack doctor begins performing an autopsy on the corpse, they note how the woman is tall, has hard wooden shoes, bandages on one foot and all her fingers are red, but Ma Mao can't help but feel bad for how cold the lady must have been in the water. That evening, Jin Shi tells Ma Mao that the lady was fine yesterday, suspecting that she must have climbed the palace walls and threw herself into the surrounding moat. Ma Mao states that it can't just be suicide, as Ma Mao couldn't find any ladder or way up on the walls by herself but notes how there are intrusion on the palace wall that can help people climb up there, revealing that Fuyu used the intrusions to climb the wall by herself. Since the victim's feet were bound to appear more small and beautiful, meaning that murder is not completely off the table either, as Ma Mao suspects the victim had tried to climb out of the moat whilst drowning, but failed, hence her red fingers. Pondering for a bit, Ma Mao thinks about how cruel the world is, as people aren't able to choose when they die, especially if they fall prey to other people. As Ma Mao begins going through her traumatic past, she asks if Jin Shi were to ever to execute her, that he would at least choose poison. Confused as to the sudden dark tone, Jin Shi states that he would never execute her, but Ma Mao reminds Jin Shi that she is simply a commoner, and that the world is quite cruel to commoners. Seeing as she may have soured the mood, Ma Mao excuses herself, but it's later revealed that the victim had also attended the garden party and people had found a written will, meaning people deemed the case a suicide. As several more days pass by, we cut to Gaoshan finally reporting that he has finally found someone with burns on their arms, revealing it to be Feng Ming, the head lady in waiting for concubine Ah Duo. Heading to chat with Shaolong, Ma Mao listens to the rumors Shaolong has heard, believing that the servant that drowned belonged to the Garnet Pavilion. People suspect that the servant was ordered by concubine Ah Duo, but Shaolan also reveals that Ah Duo will probably be replaced by a younger concubine eventually. This is because Ah Duo is one year older than the emperor, being 35 years old, and although Ah Duo was able to conceive a baby boy, it sadly passed away long ago. Hearing this, Ma Mao thinks about how trapped ladies are in the rear palace, solely being used to give birth, wondering if Lady Lahua will grow old and be replaced or if Gyokuyu will be abandoned by the emperor. Before Shaolan leaves, Ma Wamo hands Shaolan some leftover food from their most recent tea party, exciting Shaolan, but as Ma Ma returns back to the Jade Pavilion, she learns that they'll be having another tea party. Seeing as everyone is more busy than usual, Ma Ma learns that Lady Li Shu will be attending the tea party. With everything set up, Lady Gyokuyu greets Lady Li Shu, both already tense as Ma Mao notes how they both to be more wary than when the emperor was here. Watching Gyokuyu conversate, Ma Mao is impressed, as Gyokuyu is able to control and steer the conversation with her polite manners. Ma Mao heard that Gyokuyu constantly sends messages to her family, making sure to be aware of current events in the outside world, making her an intellect worthy to be a concubine. As Ma Mao glances at Lishu's food taster, Ma Mao feels bad as the food taster is scared to death of Ma Mao, and on top of that, Lishu's other lady-in-waiting doesn't seem to be paying attention. To ease the conversation, Gyokuyu asks if Lishu would like some snacks, delighting Lishu. Unveiling their sweet drink, Gyokuyu shows Lishu a drink that will warm her up, consisting of boiled orange peels and honey. But hearing the ingredients, Lishu's face drops, prompting Ma Mao to deduce that Lishu is allergic to honey all whilst Lishu's lady-in-waiting mock Lishu for being a picky eater again. Intervening, Ma Mao sips the orange and honey drink, signaling to Gyokuyu that they should offer another beverage, opting for some hot ginger water instead, pleasing Lishu. 
Seeing Li Shu's lady in waiting annoyed that Li Shu wasn't forced to consume the honey, Ma Mao confirms that Li Shu is still being bullied. As everything wraps up, Ma Mao is forbidden from helping clean up the tea party, running into Jin Shi, who Ma Mao suspects set up the tea party. Before Ma Mao can leave, Jin Shi asks if Ma Mao had heard about the rumors regarding the attempted poisoning being tied to the servant who drowned. Upon confirming that she has heard the rumors, Jin Shi asks if Ma Mao truly believes the servant took her own life, but Ma Mao can't say for certain. Jin Shi also asks why a mere servant would poison Li Shu, but Ma Mao reiterates that she doesn't know. With no other choice, Jin Shi reveals that Ma Mao will be working under A Duo, stationed at the Garnet Pavilion for the next couple of days. As Ma Mao heads over to the Garnet Pavilion, Ma Mao notes how unlike Gyokuyu's comfy jade pavilion and Liwa's refined crystal pavilion, A Duo's pavilion feels simple. Greeting Ma Mao and some other servants, Feng Ming, the head lady in waiting states that they'll be working here for the next three days, only to be interrupted by A Duo herself. Glancing at A Duo, Ma Mao is mesmerized by A Duo's masculine and feminine appearance, wondering if A Duo is truly 35 years of age. As A Duo thanks the servants for the extra help, she heads elsewhere, but Ma Mao notes how she reminds her of someone. As Feng Ming guides them around the Garnet Pavilion, Ma Mao notes how Feng Min is quite approachable, believing Feng Ming would be more entitled and from a noble family. Feng Ming asks Ma Mao and the other girls to begin dusting off some old items, but Ma Mao spots Feng Ming has bandages wrapped around her arm. Getting to work, Ma Mao notes how many items are in the room, heading outside with some books, impressed that the servants are all working hard, unlike Liwa's ladies-in-waiting. Individually spreading out and opening up the books, impressing Feng Ming, which Ma Mao notices is very fit to be head lady-in-waiting, giving plenty of compliments as well as being very observant. With a tough day of cleaning over, Ma Mao slowly waddles to report her finished work, impressing Feng Ming as she has given Ma Mao and the other servants a huge room to rest, even lighting a scented candle to set the mood. As Ma Mao lays next to the other girls, she wonders Jin Shi's reason for sending her here, having not told Ma Mao to do anything in particular. The next morning, Ma Mao watches on as all of A Duo's servants continue to work hard, even spotting Feng Ming set an example, joining in to ease the workload. Seeing this dedication, Ma Mao wonders if Feng Ming ever considered marriage or if Feng Ming chose to serve A Duo for life. Ma Mao reasons if Feng Ming was deeply loyal to A Duo, it could possibly explain Li Shu's poisoning, as Feng Ming feared A Duo would be replaced, choosing to free up a spot by taking out another fellow concubine. As Ma Mao is called to help elsewhere, she notes the abundance of honey, learning that Feng Ming's family owns a bee farm, explaining the sweet candle scent last night. Beginning to move the honey elsewhere, Ma Mao spots Lady Li Shu and her food taster, both acting frightened, wondering why they are here at the Garnet Pavilion and if it has anything to do with honey. With her three days up, Ma Mao reports back to Jin Shi, annoyed that Jin Shi is acting so nonchalant and asking vague questions. Getting serious, Jin Shi asks who would be most qualified to contact the outside world, out of the ladies in the Garnet Pavilion. Realizing that Jin Shi is leading her somewhere, Ma Mao reveals that Feng Min would be the most qualified, having deduced that the bandages around her arm link her to the mysterious colored wooden tablets, believing the tablets to have some sort of code. Happy to hear that Ma Mao is on the same page, Jin Shi dips his finger in some honey, slowly approaching Ma Mao as he intends to give her a reward. Creeped out, Ma Mao begins to back away, only to be cornered, calling out to Gaoshan for help, but no reply. Wondering if she should just give in or escape, but as Jin Shi slowly moves his fingers closer to Ma Mao, he utters that it's not honey but an aconite syrup. Upon hearing this, Ma Mao begins realizing something, piecing Li Shu's allergic reaction to the servant's drowning along with realizing Feng Ming's involvement, all tied to syrup. Luckily, Gyokuyu catches Jishin in the act, scaring Jin Shi off, checking to see if Ma Mao is alright. Still mad that Gaoshan let Jin Shi get away with such an act, Ma Mao asks to visit Li Shu, accompanied by Gaoshan. Li Shu is sad to see that Jin Shi isn't visiting, but allows Ma Mao to speak her mind, prompting Ma Mao to ask if Li Shu is allergic to honey. Li Shu is surprised that Ma Mao knows, revealing that when she was younger, her nurses forbid honey, believing it was life-threatening. 
Before Li Shu can say anything further, one of Li Shu's lady-in-waiting butts in, scolding Ma Mao for digging into Li Shu's private life, followed by another lady-in-waiting asking Li Shu to kick Ma Mao out. Seeing Li Shu being manipulated by the one so close, Ma Mao declares that she is simply following Jin Shi's orders, getting the girls to back off. Getting serious, Ma Mao asks if Li Shu is aware of Feng Ming, spotting Li Shu's being terrified upon hearing that name. As Ma Mao and Gaoshan head back, Ma Mao asks if she can learn about past events in the rear palace, prompting Gaoshan to search previous court documents, wondering what Ma Mao has figured out. Sifting through the documents, Ma Mao realizes 17 years ago while the current emperor had their now deceased son, with A Duo. Apparently at the same time, the current emperor's father had a son as well, the current emperor's little brother. The documents state that A Duo and the current emperor were raised by the same parents, making them foster siblings, but most shocking of all, the baby that passed away was delivered by Dr. Luoman, Ma Mao's father. Sadly, Ma Mao had already suspected this, spotting herbs that she saw her father growing when she was younger, and can only be found in different regions. The documents state that Luoman was expelled, leading Ma Mao to wonder the reason for her father being kicked out. Check out one of our other videos on the screen or in the info card above. Subscribe, like and comment.